Hello, we've been looking through the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit, we are looking at how God's Spirit is working in and through a fledgling church. We're now down to chapter 11, and we're going to be looking from there forward if you'd like to open up your Bibles and follow along. The rumors arrived in Jerusalem before even Peter did. They were saying things like, did you hear? Peter baptized a bunch of Gentiles into church. And did you also hear, I cannot believe it. He ate with them. He had to have been on a spiritual high following such an experience with God uh, as he meets these group of doubters as he's coming down the mountain. And it really, truly brought him back to earth. God was trying to open doors of forgiveness and reconciliation to believers around the world. And in response, the church naysayers are complaining about Peter's dining arrangements with the Gentiles. These Jewish Christians were so zealous for their laws that they didn't go to prayer to God in first seeking his will and direction. Instead, they staunchly maintained their prejudice against the Gentiles. The door of salvation was opening to Gentiles, the Ethiopian eunuch with Philip a little while before. Cornelius with Peter, and ultimately all the Gentiles. Well, those two, Cornelius and Philip, I should say Ethiopian eunuch, were both God-fearers, meaning that they, they honored the faith of the Jews. They worshiped also the God of the Jews, but they were not proselytes uh, becoming fully a Jewish. But here we see the Gentiles in Syria were another matter altogether. They did not know much of anything about Jews or the Jewish faith, their Jewish God, or, or even Jesus Christ. The Jewish Christians expected those people to make themselves presentable before they were acceptable in the church. Which gives me pause to consider, am I doing any better? Have I acted as a guard at the door of Jesus Christ's church? The question was and still remains, how hospitable and invitive are we to strangers that are coming to our doors? And in this case, their zeal over dietary restrictions and laws became the topic that began a discussion. Peter's response to them was a perfect way to deal with, with the possible conflicts that arise in relationships. He was prepared, prepared himself in advance by listening to God and not seeking after his own will and wants. He spoke calmly and accurately about all that had transpired. He saw God's spirit working in and through uh, his visit with Cornelius in, Censori in Caesarea, and he told them so. And also Peter lets them come to their own decision as he says, God gave them the same gift, the Holy Spirit, as we. Who am I to think that I could oppose God? And lastly, Peter trusted God. He trusted God to bring clarity in the issue and to work out the answer in his time. Peter might have alluded to in just a little wisp of a frustration that he, when he alters Cornelius's uh, com comment back in Acts 11, 14. He says, we're here to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to, to tell us. And Peter adds to that the word saved. And I believe Peter uses that more emphatic word saved because that's what those people needed the most. They, he was on a mission for their eternal salvation and arguing over dining room uh, rules and just seemed pretty, pretty petty. Thankfully, the naysayers were satisfied with Peter's explanation, and they had no more questions. And then they thanked God for his favor to be with them and upon them and celebrated the additions to Christ's church. But what followed after was kind of a dose back of reality of what's taking place behind the scenes. In verse 19, reminds us that 
While all this was taking place, as we were talking about God's blessing, Corinthians church and believers uh, for growth and the gift of the Holy Spirit, persecution was still wrecking havoc upon the church. Families were fleeing their homes, their jobs, and their city. They had to have been anxious and had uncertainty about what was going on. And they ran away as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And that's where Scripture talks about and focuses in on those that fled to Antioch. So let me give you a little context to that story. The Antioch was a large, the third largest, diverse city within the Roman Empire. It was situated near the border of present-day Turkey and Syria. It was a commerce center and the seat of Roman authority. There were migrant Jews that lived there, but there was a much larger population of Romans and Syrians, which was a mix between a cosmopolitan Greek and Syrian desert cultures. An interesting dichotomy. It also had a reputation for being very morally lax. They allowed ritual religious pr uh, pro prostitution and temples for worshiping all sorts of regional gods. The title of my sermon today is Plus Ultra. It's the title of the message, but it's also the theme of the church. Plus Ultra means um, further beyond in Latin. And in, in Toy Story vernacular, it means to infinity and beyond. It's pushing forward. It's going beyond where we have been. Trusting God's presence and spirit will guide us, direct us, and give us the strength to go forward. The church is engaging now the, the world, just as Jesus said it would. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Persecution that was meant to harm the church, God is now using to bless the church. What was meant to shatter faith scattered and grew the kingdom. The faithful fled their homes, but not the service to Christ. Those that fled began this bold experiment. It had always been assumed that the people of Antioch, who had little exposure to Jewish ways or, or the Jewish God, knew nothing about Jesus Christ, that they wouldn't have any interest in the good news of Jesus Christ. But this experiment reached out and shared Christ with them. And the result of that was uh, just a, an amazing scale of evangelism that just exploded, as Scripture says, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. They recognized in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them. And that's a recognition that God was working through them and bringing about this ministry success. But it wasn't just God working, it was the people as well. They were trusting in God, even through the persecution, even through the displacement, financial hardships and the uncertainty and being in a strange land with a strange community and peoples. Kind of like COVID-19 that we're dealing with. These people didn't see these issues coming. It took them by surprise. But they weren't disillusioned. They weren't depressed. They held fast to the Lord and his will. They believed what Romans 8.28 says. We know that in all things God works together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. They saw God calling them for a purpose, a divine purpose, and they were following it. The Jerusalem church wanted to help this new church plant, so they sent the encourager, Barnabas. He came to spiritually train them and, and grow them deeper in faith and in works. The ministry work continued to flourish and grow as the members were first being called Christians at that time. And that happened because there was such a diverse group, but they were all united as one in Jesus Christ. They were the first church planted as they went out into the world. 
And they, the world saw the grace of God in and working through their lives of these faithful believers. And even as they faced adversities, they pressed on in faith. And witnesses also saw that faith expressed through all things, all types of life, and they wanted what the church people had, plus ultra, further and beyond. With a vision of what could be, Barnabas went off to find Saul and bring him back to this door of opportunity to share Christ to Antioch and beyond. Barnabas knew it was very likely that Saul or Paul would eclipse him because he was such a great orator and shared wonderful messages of Christ. But Barnabas didn't care about being first. He only cared that Christ be lifted up and the church would continue to grow. The chapter closes with predictions of a coming famine, but even in the face of still more struggles, these new Gentile Christians who yesterday were called unclean and unworthy of the gospel message, demonstrated Christ's love and forgiveness by sending gifts back to the very ones who called them unclean. Such is the power of the Holy Spirit of, of the Christians, the believers that were moving forward, plus ultra. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. Isaiah 62, verse 2. We're no longer divided by names. We are one. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we will devote ourselves to honor Christ, to live for him, and to be known by his name. We are Christians. And we place our trust in that name and the knowledge that God's purpose will continue to go forward for those that believe and are willing to venture out plus ultra. Always forward, pressing on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in his name. Amen.